Thank you very much. Wow. Um, well, good evening and welcome to the final session in what um, I'm hopeful, in, indeed, I'm really pretty optimistic. Uh, many of us will fa have found an extremely uplifting and stimulating and inspiring day. Thank you very much uh, for staying with us uh, all of today. Uh, my name is Andrew Bamford. I'm a conservation scientist. I'm lucky enough to be based in this uh, wonderful uh, building named after uh, Sir David. And it's, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce now the final uh, speaker of, of this remarkable day. Steven Pinker is a world-renowned experimental psychologist. He grew up in Montreal. He did his PhD at Harvard. He spent much of his career at MIT and at Stanford, and he's now a Johnston Professor of Psychology at the University of Harvard. Professor Pinker's research spans many, many areas, but he's perhaps best known for his work in visual cognition, in psycholinguistics, uh, in social relations, and as an exceptionally influential popularizer of science. His seven best-selling books span topics ranging from the evolution of human language to his 2011 masterpiece, The Better Angels of Our Nature, uh, which argues, based on a great deal of data, that despite uh, widespread perceptions, violence in human societies has, in general, declined steadily over time. Steve has won major awards from the American Psychological Association, the Royal Institution, the National Academy of Sciences, and he's twice been a finalist uh, for the Pulitzer Prize. In inviting Professor Pinker to close today's uh, events, our original idea was that after a day of talks, after uh, all about what are sometimes major but may often seem somewhat incremental uh, stories of hope for the natural world, it would be inspiring to hear Steve's perspective uh, from his understanding of the changing history of human violence over the long term on how far greater positive societal changes do indeed take place. So we were absolutely thrilled uh, when he accepted and uh, agreed to come all the way over from Harvard for this event. But we were even more uh, pleased when we discovered that part of his next great book project is going to be about long-term changes in people's relationships with their environment. And so it's this topic he's come to talk to us about tonight in a presentation entitled Human Progress and Enlightenment Environmentalism. Please join me in welcoming to the stage, Professor Pinker. Thank you. There is a well-known saying in show business that one should never take the stage after animals or children, and I think that saying now has to be amended. But uh, thank you, Sir David, for a, a, a marvelous, inspiring presentation, and I'm sorry to disappoint you by uh, coming on next. I am going to offer a preview of uh, my forthcoming book, Enlightenment Now, The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism, and Progress, of which the most controversial part will be progress, because I have learned that intellectuals hate progress, <laughs> including those who call themselves progressive. Now, it's not that intellectuals hate the fruits of progress, mind you. Most writers and thinkers uh, will use word processors rather than quills and uh, inkwells, and they prefer their surgery to be win with anesthesia rather than without it. Uh, but it's the idea of progress that rankles the chattering class. I have learned that if you think that we can solve problems, that means that you have a blind faith or a quasi-religious belief in the outmoded superstition of the false promise of the myth of the onward march of inevitable progress. <laughs> you are a cheerleader for vulgar American can-doism with the rah-rah spirit of boardroom ideology, Silicon Valley, and the Chamber of Commerce. You are a practitioner of Whig history, a naive optimist, a Pollyanna, and worst of all, a Pangloss, the character from Voltaire's Candide who declared, uh, all is for the best in the best of all possible worlds. Well, I rather think that progress is an empirical hypothesis, that aspects of human well-being can be measured, such as longevity, health, sustenance, peace, freedom, safety, and education. If they have increased over time, that is progress. 
That was the hypothesis that I sought to test when it came to violence in my book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, uh, in which I argued on the, the basis of the evidence available that contrary to popular belief, violence has been in decline for long stretches of time. And today, we are probably living in the most peaceful time in our species' existence. I'll give you a few examples of the data sets that I reviewed in that book. Homicide records in many European countries uh, go back to the Middle Ages, and historical criminologists have plotted them over time. Here you have on logarithmic coordinates from 1 to 10 to 100 uh, homicides per 100,000 people, the trajectory of a homicide in five European regions, Europe, uh, England, Germany, Switzerland, Netherlands, Italy, Scandinavia. You can see there's been a massive decline in the rate of lethal violence. So a contemporary Englishman has about 1 50th the chance of being murdered compared to his medieval ancestors. War deaths have been in uh, de decline since the end of World War II from uh, more than 20 per 100,000 per year during the Korean War with peaks during the Vietnam War, the Iran-Iraq War a uh, worrying uptick because of the Syrian civil war, but still a fraction of the level of death that we lived through in the 80s and the 70s uh, and, and some of us in the 50s. Slavery used to be legal everywhere on earth. No one seemed to think there was anything wrong with it. But starting in the end of the 18th century, there is a wave of abolitions that swept over the world. As of 1980, slavery is not legal anywhere on earth. Despite some notable setbacks, including some we read about just last week, democracy uh, continues to increase. This is a, a, an estimate of the uh, worldwide score of democracy versus uh, autocracy. The death penalty is on death row. This is a timeline from 1860 to the present of the number of countries that have abolished the death penalty. If current trends continue, the death penalty will have vanished from the face of the earth by 2026. In the United States, there are excellent records on hate crimes, which have declined since, they have, uh, since records started being kept. Violence against women is uh, down. That is also true in the UK. Viol against, violence against children at school, physical abuse, sexual abuse, all in decline. Which leads to the question, has the world made progress in other ways? And once you start to plot measures of well-being over time, it gets uh, kind of addictive, especially when you see which way the trends are heading. Uh, we can begin with the fundamental value of all, life. This is a graph of life expectancy in uh, four continents and the world as a whole, uh, from 1760 to the present. And what we see here is a pattern that replicates itself whenever we plot some measure of well-being uh, in different regions of the world. 200 years ago, everyone was wretched. Then, uh, first, Europe and the Americas started to pull away from the world average, leading to an enormous amount of inequality uh, in the middle decades of the 20th century. But more recently, uh, Asia and Africa are starting to uh, catch up, uh, reducing global inequality and uh, raising the uh, standard of life for the planet as a whole. Uh, child mortality is another example. In uh, the 18th century, about a third of all children failed to survive until the fifth year. This is a graph for Sweden. Uh, that br is, was brought down to close to zero, followed by countries in the Americas, in Asia, South America, and now we're seeing uh, Sub-Saharan Africa starting to replicate that trend. Likewise, for maternal mortality, it used to be that a uh, the death rate for pregnancy a couple of hundred years ago was the same as the death rate for breast cancer uh, today. Uh, Sweden brought that down, then the United States, then Malaysia, and again, we have sub-Saharan Africa. Still has a way to go, but the trajectory is, is uh, promising. Sustenance. The world is starting to feed itself. Uh, here we have gra a graph of uh, undernourishment in Latin America, East Asia, Southeast Asia, and sub-Saharan Africa. Here is the trajectory for the world as a whole. Uh, wealth. The world is getting uh, richer, not just the wealthy countries of, uh, of uh, Europe, but uh, uh, Chile caught up, uh, South Korea, uh, China is uh, soaring, India is beginning to increase. Here is the curve for the world as a whole. Uh, as a result, extreme poverty is declining. Uh, by the conventional measure of a uh, $1.90 uh, per person 
per day, the amount necessary to feed oneself. Uh, by that standard, in 1820, 90 percent of the world was in extreme poverty. Today, it is 10 percent, and one of the UN's sustainable development goals is to eradicate extreme poverty from the world by the year 2030, uh, a day that uh, many of us will live to see. Children, uh, children's education is uh, increasing. Children used to be notoriously put to work on, in farms, mills, and factories, but uh, England reduced the uh, uh, children in labor starting in the 19th century, then Italy. Here we have the figures from, for the world. Again, there are deplorably high levels of child labor, but the uh, trajectory is encouraging. As a result, more and more children uh, can, uh, can read. Uh, once again, if we go back several hundred years, the entire world was illiterate. The Netherlands and Great Britain started to uh, escape from the pack, then Germany, Italy, Chile, Mexico, and here we have the literacy rate for the world as a whole. Close to 90% of uh, the world's uh, people are literate now. Uh, similar figures for a basic education through uh, seventh or eighth grade. And uh, girls' literacy is uh, pretty much close to 100% in uh, almost everywhere in the world. Not in Pakistan, but Pakistan is rapidly catching up. Uh, thank you, Malala. Uh, safety. Uh, the world is getting safer. I'm going to give you some figures for the United States, but as in most measures of well-being, the United States uh, punches below its weight compared to other developed countries. So anything that I'm showing you for the United States is even better in uh, Europe. But uh, your chance of being killed in a car accident have uh, plummeted. The chance of being mowed down on the sidewalk by a car also plummeted. Chance of dying in a plane crash, number of people who die on the job, and so on. Finally, just a few measures of quality of life. Uh, the number of hours that people spend uh, at uh, work has been in decline in the United States and Western Europe. Uh, because of the rise of labor-saving devices, uh, running water, electricity, vacuum cleaners, dishwashers, stoves, microwaves, and so on, all of which have uh, increased, the number of hours that we waste in housework has been in decline. As a result, despite everyone's complaint that they're always crazy busy, uh, measures uh, show that people have more leisure time than their parents and grandparents did. And uh, happiness, uh, as best we can tell, has been increasing. Generally, the wealthier the country, the happier its people, and the world has been getting wealthier, and as a result, people have been getting happier. Now, are people aware of all of this amazing progress? Well, the late Hans Rosling, um, a, a demographer who, has, who came up with uh, novel ways of charting the world's progress, gave Sets of questionnaires to people in a number of countries, including um, global development experts, epidemiologists, public health experts, gave them a number of questions on global longevity, population, literacy, and poverty in a, an effort that he calls the Ignorance Project, whose logo is a uh, chimpanzee, with apologies to, uh, to Jane Goodall. Uh, he used the chimpanzee as the logo for this uh, set of surveys because he said, if, if for each question I wrote the alternatives on bananas and asked chimpanzees in the zoo to pick the right answers, they'd have done better than the respondents. <laughs> in other words, people did not guess at chance. People were systematically pessimistic. They were not aware of the reduction in uh, disease, in uh, childhood mortality, maternal mortality, and so on. So people are irrationally pessimistic. This is. An interesting psychological question as to why we should be irrationally pessimistic, uh, and I think there are a number of explanations. One of them is the uh, cognitive bias documented by Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman called the availability heuristic, namely that the easier that something is to visualize, the more probable we judge it to be. It's a cognitive shortcut to judging probability that leads to systematic error. Something is in the news. Something makes a uh, big bang. We remember it. We think it's more likely. We watch the movie Jaws. We're afraid to get into the water because we think we'll be eaten by a shark, uh, and so on. There's also a negativity bias documented by a number of psychologists that across a wide range of experiences, uh, bad is psychologically stronger than good. Uh, if I were to ask you, for example, uh, between now and tomorrow, how many really wonderful, life-changing things could happen to you? You'd have to think long and hard. Uh, if I said, between now and tomorrow, how many really terrible, life-changing things <laughs> could happen to you? Uh, 
Or if I asked you, how much better could you be feeling uh, than you are feeling right now? Well, I can imagine being you know, a little happier this way or not. Now, if I ask you, how much worse can you imagine feeling than you feel right now? Well, that gives you a taste for the negativity bias, and so we remember the, uh, the negative. Tversky and Kahneman also documented an anchoring heuristic, namely, the first time you think about something, you form an impression, uh, an estimate, that tends to be extraordinarily sticky. Uh, and if you think that uh, uh, a species is going extinct, oil tankers tend to crack, crack up, uh, uh, Bosnia is war-torn, then decades after the, the fact is obsolete, it will still be your impression of uh, that particular state of affairs. But there's also a, I think a market in gravitas. It's uh, pessimism sounds smart and moral. Uh, and this has been noted for centuries. John Stuart Mill said, not the man who hopes when others despair, but the man who despairs when others hope is admired by a large class of persons as a sage. And uh, Stuart Brand, the uh, famous American environmentalist, pointed out that pessimists sound like they're trying to help you. Optimists sound like they're trying to sell you something. <laughs> well, what makes progress possible? In uh, my, the, the uh, book, I argue that it's uh, the general mindset that we have uh, adopted since the Enlightenment, the idea that we can use reason and, and science to enhance the flourishing of humans and other living things. One of my favorite modern statements of the Enlightenment mindset comes from the Oxford physicist David Deutsch, who proposed three laws. Problems are inevitable. Problems are solvable. In particular, everything that is not forbidden by laws of nature is achievable, given the right knowledge. And solutions create new problems, which are solvable in their turn. Well, can we have an enlightened environmentalism? Can we take the positive message in the, uh, uh, from the Enlightenment and apply it to the planet? I think we can. This is a uh, set of movements that go by many names, eco-modernism, eco-pragmatism, humanistic environmentalism, the blue-green movement, the turquoise movement. Uh, perhaps it, from now on it will be called the hashtag Earth optimism movement. <laughs> we will see. But first, we have to deal with hash Earth pessimism, because there's an awful lot of that. Uh, I, I think of this as 1970s greenism. And my uh, Perhaps the most famous recent exponent of Earth pessimism, or 1970s greenism, was, is uh, this gentleman, uh, Pope Francis. Now, arguing against a man who is infallible has to be the ultimate exercise in futility. Uh, and I am going to say a number of perhaps vaguely sacrilegious things in uh, arguing against this man's view of the environment. I, I think that in, in his encyclical, uh, Laudato Si, uh, it's as if the Pope kind of woke up thinking that it's 1970. The first uh, axiom of this worldview is that the Earth is a pristine ingenue defiled by human rap rapacity. As the Pope said, our common home is like a sister with whom we share our life, who now cries out to us because of the harm we have inflicted on her. Number two, the harm is inexorably getting worse and worse. The Earth, our home, is beginning to look like more and more like an immense pile of filth. Three, the root cause is the Enlightenment commitment to reason, science, and progress. As he uh, claimed, scientific and technological progress cannot be equated with the progress of humanity and history. The solution is a spiritual awakening. The way to a better future lies elsewhere, namely in an appreciation of the mysterious network of relations between things and the treasure of Christian spiritual experience. Uh, and repentance, that uh, we must engage in depopulation, degrowth, and deindustrialization, or we will be punished for our sins in a dreadful environmental judgment day. Now, I think there are a number of problems with this approach to uh, uh, dealing with pollution, habitat loss, species loss, loss and so on. For one thing, it, it is a philosophy that has an indifference to human suffering, to starvation, disease, and extreme poverty. Uh, I don't think that we can blow those off or um, not factor them into how we deal with the, uh, the planet, uh, which verges into a kind of misanthropy. I'm not going to name the environmental activist who wrote these words. Uh, we need to radically and intelligently reduce human populations to fewer than one billion. 
Curing a body of cancer requires radical and invasive therapy, and therefore, curing the biosphere of the human virus will also require a radical and invasive approach. I think when your rhetoric starts to sound like you're a Nazi, it's time to rethink your, your messaging. <laughs> um, also, this, it, I, I think that it encourages a kind of fatalism. It, you can almost summarize this philosophy as, we will all suffer a horrific apocalypse unless we immediately take extreme measures which we have no chance whatsoever of taking. Because if that is the message, uh, then you get results like the following. A survey done in, in uh, 2013 found that among people who agreed with the statement, our way of life will probably end in a century, a majority also endorsed the statement, the world's future looks grim, so we have to focus on looking after ourselves and those we love. Uh, so Earth pessimism can lead to something even worse, namely Earth fatalism. It just doesn't matter what we do, uh, we're doomed, so why try to do anything? Uh, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Uh, I think this is a, uh, a not an advisable approach to, to take, which is why I uh, applaud the organizers of uh, Earth Optimism. Um, in, I think an enlightened optimism, uh, uh, enlightened, sorry, environmentalism, would acknowledge uh, a number of uh, propositions. One is that industrialization has brought the world many gifts. It's fed billions, it's dou doubled lifespans, it's decimated uh, extreme poverty. By replacing muscle with machinery, uh, industrialization helped end slavery, helped emancipate women, helped educate children. And it has improved life in ways that we are enjoying at this very moment. We can read at night, we can live where we want, we can stay warm in winter, we can see the world, we can multiply human contact. Uh, no viable philosophy for how to proceed can blow off these accomplishments. Uh, what it means, and this may be the most sacrilegious thing that I uh, say this evening, is that some pollution is inevitable. As Robert Frank put it, there is an optimum amount, uh, amount of pollution in the environment, just as there is an optimum amount of dirt in your house. Uh, namely, cleaner is better, but not at the expense of everything else in life. Second, economic development is good. Uh, First of all, rich societies can afford to pay for a cleaner environment. I think we have seen that if people are given the choice between uh, having electricity at the cost of some air pollution and doing without electricity, they'll opt for the electricity at the cost of pollution. But if they can afford to spring for a bit extra to have the electricity without the pollution, they'll spring for that uh, extra amount. But it's not just a matter of being uh, able to afford the expense of reducing pollution, saving species, as we have heard, uh, these don't come for free. Affluent societies can afford to do things that are, by the standards of history, something of a luxury, like replacing, like, like uh, saving exotic uh, species at fantastic expense. But just as important, when people are in societies that are more affluent and more educated, their values change. They put a higher value on the environment. The World's Value Survey has uh, shown this, that uh, as societies become uh, more uh, educated, wealthier, uh, have more liberal values in general, along with that comes a concern with recycling, with conserving resources, with saving uh, species. Third, technological progress is good because it alters the trade-offs. It, it, uh, we can set as a problem to be solved how to get more calories and lumens and BTUs and bits and miles, all the good things in life, with less pollution, less water, less uh, habitat destruction, uh, fewer threats to species. Uh, via pollution control technologies, uh, densification, sparing land and uh, habitats by concentrating people and activities on smaller plots of land, through urbanization, through precision, precision farming, uh, through uh, growing, uh, getting our wood from dense plantations instead of chopping down uh, natural forests, and through the process of dematerialization. Uh, looking out in this uh, audience, I bet there are many people younger than me who do not own a uh, camera, do not have uh, reams of stationery, don't own a radio, don't own a landline telephone or an alarm clock, don't subscribe to a uh, newspaper, uh, don't have a GPS, don't have a VCR, uh, a Rolodex, a flashlight, and so on. Because these and 40-odd uh, appliances 
have all been replaced by this very small piece of matter that uh, is sitting in the pockets of many people in, uh, in this room. Um, can it work? I've just given you some reasons to think that we can bend the curve and achieve human well-being at a smaller cost to the uh, environment. Uh, well, we have heard today a number of environmental successes, a number of conservation successes, which uh, uh, Debbie Payne and uh, Mike Hoffman have documented. Uh, urban waterways in every developed country have improved drastically over the last few decades. The Thames in London is an example, but here's, this is a picture that I took in my, uh, almost my backyard. This is the Deer Island Water Treatment Plant in Boston Harbor. Uh, those of you who are, follow American politics and are old enough might recall that in uh, 1988, George Bush Sr. defeated Michael Dukakis with a famous campaign stunt in which he went on a boat ride in Boston Harbor to show that Massachusetts governor and Democratic nominee Mike Dukakis uh, was presiding over the most polluted harbor in the United States. Uh, since then, uh, this treatment plant has been erected. When I flush the toilet or do a load of laundry, it no longer gets discharged right into Boston Harbor, but rather it gets cooked in these massive eggs, and now I uh, eat lobster that is fished out of Boston Harbor. This is a story that has repeated itself in every major city in the, uh, in the developed world. Uh, world population. Uh, uh, surprising how few people realize that population growth has peaked. After a huge increase in the 20th century, the world reached a uh, peak child in the, uh, uh, in the 1960s. Since then, the rate has come down. This is the uh, uh, population growth rate. And this is a, actually a pessimistic projection that the world's population should level off uh, sometime in the 21st century. It's a gift of affluence and health. That is when people are richer and their children don't die, they have fewer children. And it's also a gift of women's education and empowerment when women choose how many babies to have instead of having the men in their society choose for them. They tend to have their first baby later. They tend to have uh, fewer babies overall. As the world gets richer, as women's empowerment increases, the, uh, we, we, should, uh, we, we will see a decline in the population growth rate and, and uh, a leveling off. Uh, it's possible that uh, resource use might uh, peak because of densification and dematerialization. The uh, uh, ecologist Jesse Osubel uh, argues that we have reached peak farmland, peak timber, peak paper, peak car, uh, perhaps even peak stuff that uh, of the 89, uh, of 100 resources whose use Ossibel tracked over the last uh, century, 89 of them have uh, peaked or are peaking. And um, in the UK, it's been estimated that a typical person used 12 tons of uh, resources in the year 2000. Uh, today, it's uh, down to nine tons. There is a report card for the world called the Environmental Performance Index, which aggregates a number of measures of environmental quality in the world's countries. And for 180 countries for which it had, has data for 10 years, there have been uh, incre uh, improvements in 178 of the 180 countries. And crucially, uh, the wealthier the country, the cleaner the environment. Uh, the, uh, the, certainly the most polluted country I have ever visited was uh, Uganda, where for two weeks I was, felt like I was breathing in uh, wood smoke and I did not see blue sky. Uh, as countries get richer, they stop burning wood. Uh, in the United States, since the uh, formation of the Environmental Protection Ag Agency in 1970, here is what's happened to a number of uh, indicators. GDP has uh, increased. Americans uh, have driven far more miles. The population has increased. Energy use increased, but uh, started to level off in the 21st century. CO2 peaked and is down a little bit, a subject that I will uh, return to. Uh, but most interestingly, the um, emission of five pollutants is down by uh, 60% uh, from starting from the year uh, 1970, even as Americans were driving like crazy, GDP went up, and there were more Americans to do all of these things. Now, this is a graph that stunned me, and it's a graph that I think we should all study, because it um, shows that the idea that uh, in order to reduce pollution, we must stop economic growth uh, needs a, a second look. In fact, 
People who think that are basically agreeing with uh, Donald Trump that you, can, you have a choice. You can have a growing economy or you can protect the environment. You've got to choose one or the other. Well, I think, unfortunately, we know which way the world will choose when it is given that choice. But it is a false choice. Uh, this graph shows that it's a false choice, that GDP can increase at the same time that pollution decreases if we choose to figure out how to get the, the best of both. Uh, so it is not true that economic growth causes more pollution. It is not only, I think, a dangerous belief because of the choice people will make, but it turns out it is not a factually correct belief. Uh, we heard earlier from uh, Francisco um, Oliveira that uh, the trend in which temperate forest deforestation has, uh, has uh, pretty much stopped is beginning with uh, tropical forests, that just in the last few decades there has been a, a huge decrease in the rate at which tropical forests are cleared. Still far too many, 150 or more than 100 million hectare, hectares a year, but this graph shows that it can uh, be brought down and it, it perhaps even replicating the success that we've seen in temperate forests. Um, oil spills, that perhaps the most conspicuous uh, symbol of assault on the environment. Uh, few people realize that even as the amount of oil transported by sea has continued to increase, the number of oil spills has, uh, has plummeted. Uh, again, showing that uh, economic activity and environmental protection do not have to be at cross purposes. We have uh, been able to grow more um, grain uh, on fewer land. This is a graph for the world as a whole showing the cereal, cereal yield, yields in hectograms per hectare. Uh, what that means is that you can feed uh, more people with less land. If you convert less land to farmland, then there, uh, more can revert to a natural state, to forest, and less forest is in danger of being cut down. And um, as, uh, as we also heard from, um, uh, from um, Mark Sinclair, yes, what? Yes, uh, the protected areas had increased. Here we have the, rate, the increase from 1990 to 2015 of terrestrial protected areas. Now um, close to 15% of the planet is protected and uh, more than 12% of the world's oceans are protected. Uh, not enough, but we can see that the, uh, that the trend is going in the right direction. And uh, still extraordinarily worrying, but, um, but there are glimmers of hope is that the um, Amount of CO2 emitted per dollar of economic activity has been in decline all over the world, most dramatically in uh, China, but also in the United States, the uh, EU, and uh, India. With the result that it's too soon to say that we've reached peak carbon, but you do see a deceleration. This is a stacked layer graph, United States, EU, China, uh, India, um, and uh, there's a, a bit of hope in this deceleration here, and uh, as, uh, as you know, there are plans for uh, deep, decarbon deep decarbonization, how uh, it is, might be possible to taper off our use of CO2 with the goal of bringing it to uh, zero. And as Sir David mentioned, the uh, Paris Climate Accord of a year ago last December was a uh, true milestone, and for many reasons, even if our um, president decides to walk away from it, which is not clear that he will, but even if he does, the rest of the world will hold his feet to the fire. There are threats of sanctions against the United States, uh, carbon tariffs on American products. There is activity in states such as California and New York to push back at the federal government. So even there, uh, all hope is not lost. Now, when people hear about these improvements, they're saying, oh, so you're saying that the environment improved all by itself, and that we don't have to worry, we don't have to do anything. Well, no. If you leave your apartment at, uh, in the morning and come back and you find that the pile of laundry has gone down, it does not mean that the laundry washed itself. It meant that someone washed the laundry. Uh, in, together with affluence and technology, which I believe are crucial drivers of environmental progress, clearly activism and policy have been indispensable. We, uh, the, Curves that I have shown are gifts of uh, environmental protection agencies in uh, most countries, of mandated energy standards, of endangered species protection legislation, 
of national and international clean air and water acts of uh, in the, uh, increasingly in the future, I hope pollutant pricing of local movements of the kind that we have learned about today, and uh, it, uh, uh, activism and policy at many other levels, including creative new options that we uh, may not even have seen yet and that some people in this room might uh, dream up. So should we be hash optimistic? Well, I, uh, when asked that question, are you optimistic, I appeal to a distinction made by the economist Paul Romer, distinguished between complacent optimism and conditional optimism. Complacent optimism is the attitude of a child on Christmas Eve just waiting to get presents the next morning. Conditional optimism is the optimism of a uh, child who gets, some hammer and, gets a hammer and some nails and some wood and rounds up a bunch of other kids with the hope of building a, a treehouse. Uh, I don't think we can be complacently optimistic. I do think we can be conditionally optimistic. Perhaps the best way of putting it would be to quote a... Um, engineer named Arthur Kantrowitz who said, um, my job is to explain two things to you. One, pessimism is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Two, optimism is a self-fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. So we've now got time for a rare uh, species, a rare treat uh, today, which is a little bit of time for some questions uh, and answers. So we've got uh, two uh, microphone uh, fairies in the audience, in the aisles, uh, Ben uh, and Brian, who will come around and uh, pick the questions, or hand you the microphones uh, if, if your question is picked by, by Professor Pinker. Hi, Professor. Thank you for your talk. Um, uh, one it's, it's great that to see this CO2 levels are dropping down per dollar of GDP, but there are, there's still huge uh, sections of sub-Saharan Africa where their living conditions aren't equal to the, to the, to the high-income world. And for them to be at the same level as us, they'd need to be consuming more and producing more and living to a higher standard. So you know, their CO2 output is, all, is going to increase. So in, in the sense that our carbon impact will decrease only if the sub-Saharan African nations or the low-income nations produce energy at a negative carbon value. So do you think that's reasonable to think that, or is there, are there other ways around it? Well, there, uh, I think that calculation is, is essential. That the West cannot say, uh, we've, we've been enjoying all this energy, but you guys, you've got to uh, live you know, sustainably just by you know, picking berries in the rainforest and, uh, and, and having maybe a solar panel, but you, you guys don't get electricity. I don't think that that's a sustainable solution. Uh, so I think that calls for uh, thought on how to provide the world uh, as much um, carbon-free energy as possible, as inexpensively as possible. Um, I think that will involve uh, that will involve the developed world taking the lead in reducing its carbon footprint. It will involve the, uh, some kind of international um, carbon standards or carbon pricing. Uh, and it will inv involve technological advances. Um, I suspect that the answer, that, that, that the, uh, answer cannot neglect um, uh, nuclear power perhaps a new generation of nuclear power, but to get the numbers to add up in the deep decarbonization projects, um, I haven't seen any sums that work that include both bringing CO2 to zero, which we have to do, in fact we have to bring it to, it has to be negative, but say zero by the turn of the century, but without consigning huge parts of the world to the current energy poverty, um, I, I'm, I'm one of those who have been convinced that, uh, that nuclear is gonna be part of the solution just because it's, it's, it's scalable, it's low carbon, uh, it's dense, uh, it's, uh, and, and indeed, contrary to most people's impressions, it is much, much safer than coal uh, in terms of the, uh, the number of deaths that we tolerate from the mining of coal, the transport of coal, uh, pollution from coal, uh, even throwing in Three Mile Island and Chernobyl, nuclear is much, much uh, safer. I realize that that itself is, all, is also sacrilegious in some uh, corners, but I, I think that's the way the numbers go. 
Go ahead. Yes. Yes. No, yes. Hi, I've loved today, and I am much more optimistic because just as general public, why doesn't anyone tell me these things? I'm also a teacher. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I, I sat there thinking, wow, this world is pretty good. And yet, when you watch the news, you think, wow, you know, what's going to happen? The world's going to end, you know, in about 20 years. So why, is, why aren't governments telling us good things to keep us happy? <laughs> so, 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 so we can think, oh, we're doing all right, let's do a bit more. Um, I, I think that is a profound question, and, and I encountered it in the realm of uh, violence before seeing the same thing replicated in the case of health and longevity and education and women's rights and so on. Uh, partly it's the, 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 the activist mindset that you just have to keep up the heat, don't let people get complacent. And, I, and there, there clearly is some wisdom in that and, and we wouldn't be where we are today unless there was uh, alarm sounded starting in the 1970s. But I think it can be counterproductive if it's taken too far, if it leads to fatalism or uh, the, the idea that what, what's, what's the point? It's just, you know, it's do-goodism. It's, it's uh, um, that uh, intellectuals, journalists, activists in, uh, have to th uh, think about getting an accurate evidence-based picture of the world so that we can identify the areas that, that, uh, that need attention, but also pinpoint what has worked so we can do more of it and to avoid either lulling people into complacency, I don't think that's really the problem, but also making sure that we don't scare them into, into uh, fatalism. Let me just scan. On that side, I'll try to get some Oh, Geographic there, there, diversity think. across the, uh, the room as well as, uh, oops, I'm sorry, okay. Just following up what you were just saying about accurate and evidence-based, certainly in this country in the last year or so, we've seen a denigration in the political world of accuracy and evidence and experts. What would you advise and what would people in this audience advise in terms of getting the environment up the political agenda for the current election? Getting the environment and the political agenda? Getting it up the agenda. Oh, uh, so I'm, I, I confess no insight into the dark arts of political persuasion or... Uh, um, so I'll, I'll, I'm going to suggest some things with little confidence that I really know whether they will work or not. Um, but I, I do think that uh, conditional optimism is an important part of the message. Look how much good we have done. Uh, why on earth would we slack off now? To say nothing of going backwards. Uh, so emphasizing that this is, that money spent on environmental protection, on, on species conservation is not do-goodism. It works. Uh, it, it's a bargain. Um, it need not come at the expense of economic growth. Um, and I think that, uh, that pitting the two against each other is a strategic and factual mistake. Also, here's one thing that I do. Here, here's some, where, I, where I will fall back on some um, uh, research in, in uh, my field and, and carry a bit of, a, of authority. The, one of the biggest problems for the environmental movement in the United States, especially the climate movement, is the branding of environmentalism as a left-wing issue. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, Ironically, environmentalism used to be a right-wing issue. In the 1960s, um, it was considered to be um, you know, kind of wealthy aristocrats wanting to preserve the view from their country estates and, uh, and, and their habitats for duck hunting and, and distracting attention from our real issues like the war in Vietnam and racism and poverty. So environmentalism from being a right-wing issue then became a uh, a left-wing issue. Um, it, this is particularly true in the United States. I don't know how true it is in, in uh, Britain. Very strongly true in the United States that you can predict someone's uh, degree of assent to the hypothesis of anthropogenic climate change, not by their degree of scientific literacy. It is not true. And, this, and scientists themselves have, are really, have really missed the boat on this. They, uh, one, one critic uh, summed up the scientists' approach to um, climate change as the, an Englishman's approach to dealing with foreigners. The solution is you speak slowly and loudly. 
The problem is not, the reason that people deny anthropogenic climate change is not that they're scientifically ignorant. And, and a number of surveys by Daniel Kahan at Yale have, have uh, shown this. In fact, people who believe in uh, man-made climate change don't do any better at tests of basic climate, change, climate science than people who deny. It. Yes, questions like which of the following is a, um, a, a greenhouse gas, a CO2, hydrogen, or you know, ozone. Uh, a lot of people who believe in climate change will say ozone, because they know it's sort of somehow bad. So it's not scientific ignorance, but what predicts it perfectly is, are you, do you consider yourself uh, a, a left-winger, a moderate left-winger, centrist, right-winger, extreme right-winger? That predicts denial of climate change uh, very strongly. Uh, it has become politicized. It be, people are, individuals tend to be more concerned with affirming statements that identify them as members in good standing of a moral tribe that they affiliate with. Uh, the idea that you should believe things because they're true um, is actually rather exotic for homo sapiens. I consider that one of the gifts of the Enlightenment. But by and large, the things that people believe, at least if they've been set up as moral identity badges, are expressions of loyalty to a coalition. So what, one of the things that we have to do is to um, unbundle that, the, them. That is to say that you don't have to be a left winger to care about species, habitat, the climate, the uh, oceans, uh, and so on. And so any messaging that frames uh, um, climate, environmental protection, or so on as a left wing issue, I think does enormous harm. Uh, that's one, I think that was one of the problems with Laudato Si. In fact, a survey of American Catholics showed that after hearing the Pope's message, they were less uh, uh, um, receptive to measures to protect the environment because they sort of thought, oh, well, there's all this, there's all that communist stuff. We don't want any part of that anti-business, uh, anti-free enterprise. There's no reason to brand uh, this, this issue with that political coloring. So that would be one piece of, uh, of just strategic advice. Uh, and this is not to say that, you know, the, doesn't mean that we, people should be indifferent between various political parties. I have my preferences as do most people in this room. But if we want to convince as many people as possible, we shouldn't make critical issues. And, and there's nothing that's critical if not climate, uh, but we shouldn't brand it to political identities that are not going to change tomorrow. Just one more, I think. One, one more, and uh, let me see. Who's had their hand up a long time? And yes, OK. Hello, thank you for the talk. Um, really, really interesting. And I'm also kind of optimistic for human well-being. Um, I guess more of a comment on the graph you showed about in the US, you've got increasing population, increasing GDP, increasing vehicle miles, and decreasing pollution. Um, I would predict, and from data that I've seen, that if you put on what they've been importing from other places, that that view might change. And I suppose it's important to take a big picture perspective of, are we just exporting our pollution as industrialized countries? Yeah. And you know, the, in the US, you know, the factories have closed down, and Trump talked about that an awful lot. Yeah, by, by and large, I don't think that's the explanation, because uh, the <coughs> most, the, uh, it may be uh, part of it, but if you look at energy use and emissions, a lot of it comes from uh, vehicles, trucks and cars, from uh, home heating, from electricity generation, uh, none of which have been, can be uh, outsourced. We still burn coal, gas, and oil to get our electricity, to heat our homes, uh, to f uh, fuel our cars, uh, none of which has been outsourced. So the sector that's just due to manufacturing uh, some of that perhaps has been transferred to, to uh, China and, and India, although in their turn, for this, the same reasons, they're reducing their, their emissions. But uh, I think the majority of it comes from um, cleaner cars, cleaner factories, uh, switch certainly in the United States from coal to uh, gas, um, more fuel efficiency, catalytic converters, those um, uh, um, composting uh, uh, sewage treatment eggs that I showed you in Boston Harbor. There have been enormous technological and economic changes that I think account for the lion's share of it. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.
we're going to have to call it a day um, for questions for now, but I'm sure if you uh, uh, come down at the end, uh, Professor Pinker will be glad to answer your questions. In a moment, I'm going to hand over uh, to uh, Mike Rands, the director of CCI, to draw the day as a whole to a close. But just before that, I want to, uh, I want to thank uh, Stephen, too, for a, a fantastically stimulating talk. He's shown us, um, I think, fairly convincingly that by many measures, well-being increased, longevity is up, sustenance is up, housework is down. That's good news. <laughs> I, I'm just hoping that my email inbox is going to shrink as well. That would make my day. Um, at a large scale, many aspects of the environment are improving, and some of the key drivers uh, of environmental degradation are slowing. And above all, he um, presented empirical evidence that uh, progress can and does indeed happen. And, and that means that alongside all of the stories of individual success that we've heard during the day, I think we can take home some long-term uh, reasons uh, to be not complacently uh, but uh, conditionally optimistic. So thank you so much for travelling all the way um, from Harvard to share your ideas with us this evening. Thank you. <laughs> Mike Rands. Thank you, Andrew. Um, thank you all. This has been quite the most wonderful experience uh, for me and I think for many of you that we've had in a long time. Uh, we've heard some remarkable stories, narratives from some incredible people representing remarkable organisations, quite extraordinary organisations, and giving us real reasons for hope uh, and optimism. We've experienced a fantastic solutions fair which has offered us significant things that we can do. I think it's been the perfect use of the David Attenborough building and exactly what Sir David urged us only a year ago when he opened the building uh, to do, to communicate, to share, to explore new ideas, to bring different audiences together to address what is undoubtedly a major conservation challenge, as we all know, and most speakers never shied away from that throughout this day. But Earth Optimism, as uh, Nancy said from, in her message from Washington, is about changing the focus for conservation, from identifying the problem to delivering the solution. It's not about denying the problem or the scale of the problem but it's about seeking to engage everyone in moving from a sense of hope, uh, sorry, from a sense of loss to one of hope without ignoring the scale of that challenge. Well, today we've heard incredible reasons to be optimistic, to be hopeful, uh, and perhaps even more importantly and excitingly, we've learnt that there are lots of things that each and any one of us can do. So our challenge is how we do that and how we get everybody else doing it. We reckon that over 1,300 people joined us here in Cambridge today, um, and many of them have made pledges in their passport. As Rosie mentioned earlier, there are 25 Earth Optimism events going on around the world. The smallest, I think, is taking place in the city of Ely, north of here, tomorrow. The largest has taken place in Washington, D.C., thank goodness. Um, and even the International Space Station has joined in. So what are we going to do next, and what can you do next? Well, here in CCI, simple, practical thing, all these wonderful, brilliant, inspirational, as people keep saying, talks that we have heard throughout today will be available on the website within days. They've all been recorded, so please... Take another look, better still, share them with other people, um, especially people who don't necessarily know how wonderful conservation is and what is already happening. Do it through social media, do it through the internet, do it through telling the stories or retelling the stories yourself. That can be a very powerful thing. Distribute the passport, share it with other people, particularly what you learnt from uh, going around the solutions fair. And we here, again, will follow up on the pledges that people have made, see how they're doing, see whether they would like to share them with others, uh, and try and maintain the momentum through that. Next year, 
the Cambridge Conservation Initiative, the partners based in, here in this building and, in, and around it, or with a presence in it, will be launching a Cambridge Festival of Nature. We don't know the nature of it exactly yet, but the idea of it will be to continue to share stories, ideas, successes and solutions, particularly with those who are not already familiar with them. So please come along, please encourage other people to come along next year and the year after and the year after. The next Global Earth Optimism event uh, is planned uh, by um, Nancy and the Smithsonian Institution for 2020. An interesting year for those who follow intergovernmental processes in terms of setting targets and future plans at the global and international level through cooperation and collaboration. And despite the major challenges we have in that, if you look at what was happening 60 or 70 years ago in terms of international cooperation for conservation, there was the only one that David referred to in terms of Wales. Now there are many, many of them. They may not all be working, but they're there at a global a national and a local level and we need to build on that and we need to make them better and we have the opportunity to do that as we have seen through today. We've seen and heard many conservation heroes um, today um, but we can all become conservation heroes. If you can take what you experienced at the Solutions Fair and share it with other people, family, friends, enemies, better still, uh, and, and people who don't actually know or think they care about the natural environment in the way that many of you, I suspect, do, because that's why you're here today. So I would argue that optimism is central to our own survival, um, and when you and your friends and colleagues and so on are deciding how to vote, whether it's for a local mayor, whether it's in a national election, or whether it's about what you want your future government, wherever it may be, to do in acting internationally. Just remember how important Earth Optimism is and remember what we all learnt and enjoyed so much today. I'd like to close with a few thanks. Um, firstly, I would like to say uh, we did this event on a shoestring here in Cambridge. We always do. We seem to have make it a habit. But we are incredibly grateful to the RSPB, the National Trust, Marks and Spencers, and the AG Leventis Foundation, who gave us hard cash to be able to put the show on at all. So special thanks to them, and also to John Lewis and Hotel Chocolat, who whilst they didn't give us money, they gave us lovely chocolate and lovely marketing and lots of other things to help make us more optimistic. Secondly, I'd personally also like to thank the incredible speakers, the chairs, the stallholders at the Solutions Fair. It was extraordinary, brilliant, and conservation at its best. Uh, and I think um, they can all be very proud of what they have done, their storytelling, and what their institutions and those individuals have achieved. And I'm deeply humbled by it personally. I'd also like to thank the incredible volunteers that we have had from many CCI partners, but from many other organisations as well, uh, that have helped make the day work and a success for all of you. Um, and that includes CCI staff, CCI services staff, Department of Zoology, uh, especially RSPB and TBA, as, sorry, Tropical Biology Association, uh, as two, two of the partners whose staff have worked tirelessly to make this whole thing happen. I'd like to acknowledge, however, just a couple of people individually as well, because they had the idea, they have done so much of the thinking, so much of the work behind the scenes, pestering, um, probing, delighting, ignore, annoying, and, and uh, so many people, but without them, this would never have happened. And that is, I'd like to ask them to stand up wherever they are in the room, Andrew Barnford, Rosie Trevelyan, uh, Shelley Balderson, uh, Sam Owen and Elizabeth Allen. So please stand up and let us... <laughs> Come on.
Thank you, they absolutely deserve that. Um, and now, let me just say, of course, the biggest thank you goes to all of you for coming, for caring, for sharing, and for making this event the success, the success it has been. Before you leave, can I just ask you to do one more thing? So if you've decided on the basis of today to do something different and better for the environment, something you've learnt, something you've shared with somebody else that you think, right, well, I'll do more of that, can you now please just stand up? So, so, if there is anybody sitting down, <laughs> and I can see there are, but there's hastily, th it's all right, no, no threats. If you're, so, I would like all of you to congratulate yourselves, to think, make sure you do what you said, what you, now you've all stood up, we've got your names, we've got a photograph of this. <laughs> um, uh, we shall be coming back and asking you all um, whether you did it and whether you can share it. But thank you, and you've been wonderful, and so has everything else today. So just remember, whenever you don't feel optimistic or you need something to make you optimistic, just remember today, remember all the people who are standing here and what we can do together. Thank you very much indeed.